Shout out to Malachi. How you doing, Malachi? How you doing uh, today? Doing, I'm doing great. Um, why did you come here today? Well, I was. Uh, it was a, an invitation to have a conversation about some of the work that I've been doing as the chief prosecutor in Ramsey County, and uh, um, it's an opportunity to connect with people. Uh, great. We are we are the voice of the voiceless, and yeah. it's called "I Got Something to Say." You're on the right place to let us know who you are right. and, and what the good works you've been doing in our community. Um, to start off, um, there was an initiative that you started with um, um, stop. You wanted it when it came to traffic stops yeah. and things like that. Right. Now, how's that going? How's that been? When did you start it? Yeah. How, that, how has that been going? Well, I think that work is so important. And, you know, I've gotten a lot of criticism uh, for kind of weighing in on that particular issue. You know, as a chief prosecutor, my job is to, you know, when the police send me a case to look at to determine whether or not a crime has been committed okay, and uh, make an appropriate decision, right? right? But as I have been learning more and connecting to community about how some of these cases come to my attention, um, I know that there's a way of policing all across America, and it's legal. The United States Supreme Court has said that, you know, if you observe somebody with a, a, a violating a law because they have like an equipment violation, like one headlight out, or the tabs are expired, or there's something hanging from your rear view mirror, that you can essentially pull them over for that purpose, but then conduct a further investigation to determine what else is going on. And what we know is that that type of policing has really negative consequences to lots of people in our community. Uh, we call it driving while black. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that policing happens across this country, we know that policing is saturated in black and brown neighborhoods. And so when the community is subjected to that type of policing, um, we know it doesn't go well, uh, whether it's for the, the person who's driving the car, the motorist, or even the police officer. And I think that we have just assumed that that type of policing actually works, but the truth is it really doesn't. In fact, um, we know just by looking at data that uh, only uh, in 2% of the cases in which they do that type of policing, they'll actually find some version of contraband, whether it's guns or drugs. So think about the other 98% of the time uh, when they're maybe pulling people over for equipment violations and utilizing it for a, a potential to do a, an additional type of search. So when you have a hit rate like that, that's so low, you know, where in America, what industry would we ever allow for something to perpetuate mm -hmm. um, over and over again when you're only finding guns or drugs 2% of the time? Yes. And then we also know the, the motorists that are subjected to this, um, there's massive racial disparity. Just in my community alone in St. Paul, uh, African-American motorists are four times more likely to have been pulled over for these non-public safety traffic stops. And we also know that when these traffic stops occur, oftentimes the police officer could be asking for consent to search the vehicle when there is no reason to even ask that question. And it's also a very coercive one in which people would say, they would feel very uncomfortable telling the police, no, you can't search my vehicle. Right. Even though they may have the legal right to say no. Right. And so this type of policing is, it's coercive to what we want, which is a good relationship between police and community. We want community to feel like they're being protected, not being surveilled. Right. And just by the sheer numbers of the 
you know, 98% of the times that they're not finding contraband, right? Mm -hmm. We know that this policing doesn't work. I used to be a prosecutor that believed that that was good policing. Okay. And you, I'm, you... But I've came to a place where as I learned more about the data, the research, um, and looking at the disparities, that it's wrong. And so I said back in September of 2021, I don't want to prosecute cases that originate from that traffic stop because I don't want to perpetuate that type of police practice, nor do I want to incentivize it in any way. And so our policy basically says that if you are presenting a case to me and it was a result of one of those non-public safety traffic stops or you asked for consent when you didn't have the basis to ask for consent, that we're not going to prosecute those cases. Yes. Now, of course, everybody's heads exploded mm -hmm. and saying, what do you mean you're not going to prosecute crime? What I'm trying to do is basically tell the police, and I'm working with the police on this, and my, my message to them is that if we change the way that we do policing, we'll actually be safer in the long run. Definitely. And we'll have more safety, we'll have more trust, right? And so thankfully for me, I had St. Paul, Roseville, and Maplewood that uh, were, went along with this policy and they enacted their own changes. And because of the changes that they made and because of the changes that I made across Ramsey County, um, those types of traffic stops, the non-public safety ones, which would be the equipment violations. So one headlight out, one brake light out, or something dangling from your rear view mirror, loud and excessive muffler noise, uh, an expired tab that those those traffic stops have dramatically fallen. Mm -hmm. And so in about a month or so, we'll be releasing uh, public information about the impact, but you'll see the graph, it just goes straight down to nothing uh, for those three jurisdictions. But then at the same time, uh, there are some jurisdictions in Ramsey County that didn't go along with my policy. And interestingly, their traffic stops go way up. Right. 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 Almost like they're trying to spite the policy. Right. And I really believe that um, if we can get to a place where we recognize that these types of stops and this type of policing doesn't deliver public safety, that if you say that you're going to stop doing them and then we've come up with alternatives, why not mail the person uh, information that their tabs are expired? Why right. not have to pull somebody over? Right. right? Why don't you tell them if you come into the police station, we'll give you a, a coupon for getting that headlight fix, right? Yeah. That builds trust. Yes, definitely. That's something that the public would welcome. And that's what's been happening in St. Paul and Roseville and Maplewood. We've been utilizing lights on uh, coupons. We also are going to be launching a program that helps people pay uh, help gives financial assistance for people who might be in arrears mm -hmm. uh, with their tabs because it's very expensive to get good once you've kind of fallen in a hole. Right. And so that's the type of justice that we need, that version of uh, public safety and justice that says that we are not going to be looking at communities and saying that there must be problems here. We're going to look at communities as a resource and meet communities where they're at and try to help. And that's that's the, that's a difference. So that's a great segue into the next question, which is looking at the, the change in Hennepin County. We went from Mike Freeman to a Mary Moriarty um, and we say we can say a right wing prosecutor to a left wing prosecutor. Um, and are you familiar familiar with the Larry Krasner out of uh, yeah, Pennsylvania? Right. I, when, I, when we when we sort of put people down not to cast you. Or, or make you someone you're not. Where do you fit in with a, with Larry Krasner sort of being the yeah. milestone or, right. or, or or along these lines? But we have Mike Freeman, we have Mary Mordiati, totally different. Then we have the progressive behavior yeah. of a, a, a Larry Krasner. Where do you find yourself in that mix? Well, I think we shouldn't put people into boxes, right? But I'm clearly a progressive county attorney, a reform-minded county attorney. I think there's can be danger by saying that the, commu the communities in all parts of America are wanting the same thing. Right. right? They don't. They, I think they have nuanced things. I am trying to represent the aspect of my community that has never been at the table. Mm -hmm. I think a progressive uh, reform-minded prosecutor will take on racial disparity head on. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to say that um, these issues uh, are something that I can't control or that these issues are something that are so complicated that I don't have a role to play. I actually believe that the prosecutor does have an important role to play in 
uh, mitigating and addressing uh, racial disparity and discrimination in our criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. And another big part of this too, I think reform-minded prosecutors will recognize that we need to acknowledge much of many of the harms that have occurred in the justice system to people that have been impacted in uh, in the criminal justice system. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, because I think that um, we have to recognize that like victims and people who find themselves uh, accused of crimes, oftentimes they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. And they come from the same communities. And so I think there's lots of complexity there. But I think historically, prosecutors have not seen it that way, um, that we have been, um, I guess, enforcing laws, exacting punishments. And that's exactly what our communities want. But I don't think that we've actually asked our communities what they want. Right. And I, as more communities are coming to the forefront, they're wanting to see uh, the bold changes so that we can actually say that our legal system uh, is worthy of being called the justice system. Correct. And that, that's a that's a big, big hurdle because what we've seen is the the the, the racial dynamics of it, the race uh, policing why why uh, uh, policing in general that that specifically um, uh, looks at uh, black males as being uh, this uh, vitriolic uh, 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 enemy of the state, and it polices in that way. What I wanted to point out was a couple of initiatives that you did, like the expungement, yeah, uh, the, and, but also the medical examiner that you actually went after. There's two th things that I really didn't know uh, about um, the uh, the uh, that 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 situation, and we actually looked up the the fact that the case came down from the feds, mm -hmm. but it was your medical examiner that was sort of subcontract himself out or however, mm -hmm. but you took it upon yourself to go back and check those cases out. Right. How did that play out? Well, we're still in the process of it, but it's so important that what happens in the legal system, we need to have the public have trust and confidence that they were the right outcomes. Right? Yes. And so here we have a situation where a federal district court judge is calling out the uh, reliability mm. and the testimony of our medical examiner. And if you read the, the opinion, it goes so far and so deep that I felt like in order to ensure that there's trust and confidence in the work that we did to obtain convictions, and if we relied on his testimony, that we need to just take a quick review of like what those cases are. And then if there's a need for a deeper review, we need to do that. And Definitely. so right now we're, we did the quick review in terms of just scanning all of his cases. And then what we looked for was, um, was his testimony or what he would have told uh, the prosecutors critical to um, important issues in the case, such as like the cause of death. Okay. So a medical examiner oftentimes will determine whether how a person died. And so in many cases, it's pretty simple. It's person got shot and bled to death, right? Yeah. But in other situations where there's issues about how this person died or when this person died, mm -hmm. the medical examiner's testimony is really critical in trying to understand what the truth is. Yes. And so if we have a, a, a decision in North Dakota that says that he was being misleading about some of those things, we need to go back and take a deeper look. And so right now we are, have about 71 cases that we're doing a deeper look into. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. And then we'll kind of um, narrow that down. And if there's more work to be done, we'll t even take a deeper dive where we're going to hire outside medical experts outside of Minnesota mm. to review that work. That's great. That's yeah. fantastic. I was It was good to, to see and hear that. Um, at what particular point in your career did you decide that what you were being told and what was truly going on was wrong. Mm -hmm. And at some particular point you made the change and you, you just, you, you're, you're, you're actually, um, that's, that's how you became progressive. Yeah. Right. But what, what, what was it? A, what it, was it one incident that yeah. caused it? Yeah. What was it? Yeah. You know, um, I am certainly not the same prosecutor today than I was when I first started back in 2011. Okay. And I think there are a number of things that have, allowed me to evolve and to be better connected uh, to community. I think one of the issues that I had to confront was uh, my role in holding police accountable 
uh, when they are involved in causing the death of a civilian. Uh, and that case was uh, the case involving Geronimo Yanez and the death and killing of Philando Castile. Mm. Remember, I was the first um, prosecutor to actually charge a police officer in the line of duty for k killing uh, someone. And in that particular case, as we all know, um, you know, Philando Castile's last words were in protest that he wasn't reaching for it. Um, but in that situation, we had an officer who basically came, uh, who first of all, um, saw a vehicle passing through Larpenter Avenue. And somehow in his mind, he looks at this car with, you know, uh, Diamond Reynolds and Philando in the front seat. I don't know if you saw the four-year-old in the back, mm -hmm. but somehow concludes that maybe this person that just drove by me is the person who robbed a convenience store <laughs> from three or four days ago. <laughs> and I don't know how you come to the conclusion that just somebody who's driving across the street is that person. Why on earth would somebody come back to the same place? Yeah. <laughs> and... So he obviously did not have the, the legal justification to even pull Philando over. Mm -hmm. So what he decided to do was exactly what I was talking about, which is to follow him and look for some reason, a legal reason to, follow, to pull him over. Right. And the legal reason was that his brake light, uh, the middle one in the back, right, was not working. <laughs> And so he uses that justification to pull him over, right? Yes. Something that, again, through the work that we're doing around non-public traffic safety stops, we're saying eliminate that tool from your toolbox. Right. You don't need to do, do that type of policing, right? So he has the legal reason to pull him over, comes out of the car, right? And then uh, based upon the interaction, and if you listen carefully to what's being said, it's Philando Castillo Ed is trying to put the officer at ease. He says, sir, I have to tell you in the most kindest voice that I do have a firearm on me. And keep in mind that Philando had that gun lawfully and legally. Yes. Right? Yes. And for some reason, as he's saying that, I think he's making some movement to get his, like, because right before the officer asked him for license and registration. Yes. And so I, I think his, uh, his, his hands might be moving. We don't know for sure because there's no video inside that car. But I think as he was doing that, he's talking to him, trying to put him at ease. But yeah. for some reason, the officer goes from zero to 100 right. and shoots him. And so I, we charged Officer Yanez with the appropriate crimes. But we, and one of the biggest regrets in my career is that we weren't able to get a conviction against him. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time, that was a while back ago, and I don't know that juries were ready to convict officers. Right. Uh, but it's a big regret that I have in my life, and I haven't for many days. I think about that. And so I've turned that into action. So, you know, Valerie Castillo and I go around talking to the other parts of the country talk about some of the partnerships that we've worked on to help prosecutors and police um, better respond to these types of incidences. Yes. Um, and then also too, I've always been reflecting about why that occurred in the first place. And it was because of a non-public safety traffic stop. Right, right? yes. And that's what le has led me to better understand the, the, the harm and the impact, how this type of policing, how this type of justice system uh, can really contribute to really bad things happening in our community and a diminishment of trust. Mm -hmm. And so my goal in all of this is to try to bring community and police together and have a better version of policing, a better version of our justice system. But we can't get there unless people are willing to stand up and do bold and courageous things to get our community to start grappling with these issues. Issues that we have just kind of you know, put underneath the rug and said, we don't need to talk about these things. And so that's the goal of what I'm trying to do. And I recognize that uh, in many ways that uh, the, the, the leadership that I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to show up as, as a progressive uh, district attorney, county attorney, is to um, uh, address the racial disparity that exists in our, in our community and in our justice system. Um. We're about to go to break yeah. now and come back, but I got one last question. Um, the question I have is that um, what 
could you say, if I didn't know who John Choi was, yeah. what could you say to me to that would define who you were? Or what is there something that you would like people to know about you that no one knows about you to make you more? Because prosecutors across the board, when I first met you, I was like, you're one, you're one of my favorite prosecutors. I know a lot of individuals don't don't hear that, but because I was part of the criminal justice system, I followed you along your along the ways. So I do have I do look for progressive individuals who are trying to, but besides that, what would you like our viewers to know about you? Yeah. To make you human, to make you more than just a guy who is sending people to jail. Right. Well, I think uh, what I want people to know is that I'm really deeply committed to um, uh, bringing people that have never been at the table to be a part of this conversation, that I'm not here in my job to tell people what the justice system does. In fact, I want to under better understand uh, what the justice system has been doing and, and how it's being perceived throughout our entire community. And through that work about representing community, and community is, includes not just victims of crime, but it includes uh, people who are accused of crime, it includes their families, and that I have taken uh, efforts to try to humanize everybody and to recognize and find the opportunities for change and to create a better version of our justice system. For that, being a pro individual in that group, in that community, I wanna thank you for doing that because it takes a lot of courage yeah. to be that individual um, and walk that, walk that, walk that walk. Because it's not, you're, you're gonna get more accreditations or more commentations when you lock people up and for a billion years, but then being the individual to say that that was wrong and it's a better way to go about it. Right. So for you to take that position and take that, take, walk that walk, I, I commend you and I thank you. And we're gonna go to break. prison lawyer i have y'all didn't think we we're going to do it we're moving we're moving uh mountains around here we got phenomenal john Choi um in the house with us today and he's talking about all the progressive things he's done um with us um and um i'm just gonna just uh, reintroduce yourself for us again, John, and then we're going to get into talking about expungements. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm John Choi, and I serve as the Ramsey County Attorney. Glad to be here. How long have you been in Ramsey County? So I was elected first in 2010, so 2011 Ooh. is when I started. So I've been around for a while. Yeah, you, yeah, you got You're a vet now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, yeah. It's an OG. Uh, so um, we're, so um, I just had uh, Jonathan McCullen on from Minnesota Justice uh, Coalition talks a lot about expungements and yeah. you made that being utilized as a way to get people back into the workforce. Where are you, where are you, where do you sit on that? Yeah. So th this is a, a, an area that I'm really passionate about. I believe that the prosecutor has a really important role Definitely. in uh, helping people get on with their lives. Yes. And we as a society need to stop punishing people after they have done everything that we've asked them to do. <laughs> and there are so many people out there who may have a felony conviction, they served their term of probation, or they went to prison and they're, they're done with their prison sentence. But then what we don't understand in America is that it's almost impossible for people to gain employment, access to housing, so, education. Yes. And so what we're doing is we're actually continuing to punish people Definitely. when they've done everything that we've asked them to do. Americans, we go to places of worship, whether it's a mosque or a synagogue or a church, mm -hmm. and we talk about and we say that central to our, uh, as human beings, are these values of redemption, yes. rehabilitation, reconciliation, yeah. forgiveness, yes. right? 
but we don't practice that as a society. Not at all. And so one of the areas that I just think that we need to really double down on is this notion that if we can help people seal their records through expungement, because, you know, there are some criminal records that we probably want people to know. Like, for instance, if you have committed some really serious violent act, I mean, probably your neighbor deserves to know that. Right. right? But I think the vast majority of the things that people might get convicted for, nobody needs to know. Right. <laughs> and, and I think we need to figure out ways that we can encourage employers to hire individuals with past felony records. So one way is um, having a robust way of having expungements, right? I mean, if you were arrested and you were diverted and you were successful in that diversion, that should be wiped out yes. clean, right? If you're a misdemeanor offense or, or even many felony offenses that are just people don't need to know, we, we should figure out a way to do that. So as a prosecutor, we've been actually working with our community to find people to help because I have the power yes. to help expunge records. And if I make the petition, yes. right? Yes. Instead of asking people themselves to do it, because right. if they do it themselves, they got to hire an attorney. It's very complicated and it costs a lot of money. Yeah, definitely. And so we're working with community to try to find people that we can help to try to expunge your records. We also have a bill right now at the legislature um, that would make it automatic for lots of these types of offenses that really the public doesn't have an interest in needing to know about them. Yes. So I think we should do it automatically. Right. And there are studies that say that if we can expunge people's records, that their uh, ability to make a living in their, in their economic uh, position in life increases 20%. What job program or what economic development program does that? Right. I feel personally like I was watching Ozarks. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a series. Yeah, it's a great show. <laughs> watching it like crazy. Pretty violent, though. <laughs> but it's just, so it's just wow. So I'm, I don't, this is probably like my fourth time watching it all the way through. Yeah. It's pixely. Uh, okay. Um, uh, all, all the way through. And um, um, so what I, what I was getting at is when um, Ruth, he, get, Ruth gets the opportunity to expunge her record yeah. and how she changed yeah. based on that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And that's when you were talking about expungement. I thought about the same thing being that, you know, expungement gives me the ability to understand what the criminal conviction caused in my life, the benefit that I have. I respect it a lot more, but I feel like I'm part of the community again. Right. So now I'm vested in it. Yeah. And I do truly want to see be better uh, prosecutors, better cops, better citizens. Um, 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 uh, one thing I can say about being in prison, that community functions so well without any type of uh, 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 additional uh, uh, police officers or enforcement or anything like that because it's a community. Um, and I think that understanding once a person goes through that conviction and comes back out they want to be a a, a citizen again right. and actually understands what it means for the right. most part one question i did have about I'm, I'm be, i'll be talking to paul snell later on mm -hmm. um so the the main push has always been low-level offenses mm -hmm. uh knowing that a, a, a good percentage of individuals are are on violent crimes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also understanding that they have the lowest rate of recidivism. Yeah. So is there any progressive move to try to tackle that, those individuals um, and give them programming? Because right now, when I talk to people who are locked up, they'll tell me like they have thousands of programs for individuals who have nonviolent offenses against right. individuals, but there's nothing for us. Right. And I think that's a, a part of justice reform as we, take more steps in this area, we have to recognize that uh, when we're talking about violence, you know, it's hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of need for um, services and supports for mm -hmm. that population because we have to realize that short of if you haven't killed somebody, um, you're probably going to be getting out of prison I mean, I mean, there's going to be a prison term, but it's not going to be forever. Right, right. Definitely, you're coming home. And even for people that have uh, committed you know, homicide, at some point, they're going to come, come home. home. Yeah, definitely. Right. And so are we truly a society that says that we are going to focus on helping people rehabilitate and then ultimately reenter society in a productive way, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can't have conversations about 
justice reform unless we also are willing to have a conversation about some of those things. I think politically, those things are kind of hard right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you that we're never going to have true justice until we actually figure out ways in which we um, can better think about reentry and rehabilitation for everybody that yeah. is in our criminal justice system. Well, well you, if you look across the waters into Eurocentric countries, they sort of figured it out where they're not giving people life sentences even when they commit murders. Right. And, they, and their jails, still does, they don't look like our jails. They're not cells. They're, yeah. They look like apartments. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I don't understand, like, why one place has figured it out. Like, you don't have to do it in one place attest to this is the only way that it works right. and it doesn't work and we yeah. know it. Right. Um, so I, 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 it's a, it's a lot of politicism in, in our conversation yeah. and, and, and you can't fake it. Criminal justice makes a lot of money mm -hmm. across the board. Um, what I've been, what I've been seeing, I've, I've been watching um, um, Larry Krasner, but also been watching uh, John Piff Mm -hmm. uh, P oh, fat. Fat, fat, fat. Yeah. Yeah. and I want to get him to come here and I actually yeah. want to get him on the show, yeah. but he has written a book that, 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 um, is the next, what well, was the second Jim Crow really? Cause it's really sh shedding light on the criminal justice system. Have you read the book? Yeah. I know John Pfaff. I've been in rooms with him. Oh, I don't know okay. if I've had a chance to actually read the book from, from beginning to end. You're right. Yeah. yeah. It, he seems to be, uh, a star worth in his in his area. And yeah. He says some of the things that that can at least open up the conversation of some type of aggressive reform mm -hmm. when it will or it just correction of the system. Yeah. Um. The way he talks about the the role of the um judge being um reduced in order to give the power prosecutor more pro power. Right. And um and that in turn, although the sentencing or the uh the number of individuals who were charged didn't mm -hmm. go up. We still had a lot of people in prisons because of the overcharging of individuals. Yeah. So let me talk a little bit about that because I know enough about what he's written about. And I think what he's talking about there is that um, prosecutors have a, enormous power in the way that our justice system works. We have this false belief that somehow it's like uh, it is on TV where most cases get resolved uh, by a trial. Like right, we yeah, have a, yeah, a judge yeah, and we have like jurors. Yeah, yeah. That's only about 2% yeah, of the cases. Yeah. The vast majority of the cases, they get resolved by plea yeah, negotiations, yeah, right? Yeah. And so the, the, the prosecutor has a lot of power there, right? And so in that context, the reforms, right, that yeah. John Pfaff is talking about, really critical to understand like what the prosecutor can be doing, right? So yes. In that context, you know, it, it, this isn't just the prosecutor in Ramsey County, but since 2013, that's a long time ago, right? It's about 10 years ago, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. So we've reduced the number of people that we have actually sent to prison by over 50%. So I'm going to say that again. Since 2013, we have reduced the number of people that we have sent to prison by over 50%. How so, did you do that? So every year, that number has gone down, right? And I think people have this false assumption that if we send more people to prison, right, that somehow we're going to be safer. Right. And you can compare our crime statistics and our incarcerations, right, with maybe Hennepin County right next door mm -hmm. or any place in America. And I'm willing to bet that our level of safety or crime is not any worse than anywhere else. Correct. And so we just have all of these false assumptions. So this false assumption that somehow justice is done through a trial. Right. False. Yeah, definitely. That safety is somehow achieved by sending everybody to prison. False. Correct. Yes, definitely false. And so that this is where I think, you know, we, the prosecutor can play an important Huge. role to help work with communities to better understand that. And to try to figure out ways that bring safety and justice for everybody, the way that we've concocted safety and justice and how we try to get that is to try to keep certain people safe, but not think about the fact that there are communities that have been dealing with violent crime forever. Zip, zip, zip. They call it about the zip codes, like right. certain zip codes have been sent to prison and these are multi-million. Well, you won't give them any social services yeah. that correct they keep them from going to prison, right. but when they go to prison, you want to give them a million, a hundred million dollars right. to sit in these prisons. Right. Um, so that's 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 a pro that's that's a huge problem. Um, so um, with the 
I, I saw, I saw, I saw, I told, I told you I interviewed Bo Ra Ra. Mm -hmm. And re re really, back when we first started this podcast, yeah. you became the top person on my, wanted to get on the show because she mentioned the, the sensitivity training that you yeah. gave you to your prosecutors, yeah. which I thought was, was, was crazy. Yeah. Like, like this guy, you know, but, but, but then I asked her, I was like, why did, why did he, he, why do you, why do you have to make prosecutors sensitive? And she was like, this is Noel talking to me. And she actually participated in yeah. it. She was incarcerated and you yeah. brought people who were yeah. incarcerated to talk. And she said, but a lot of guys are just so, educated they never really meet anyone outside right. Right. other than going to court so they really don't know yeah. what's going on so what what brought, what brought you to wanting to do something like that and are you still doing it yeah absolutely and i want what i want is for my prosecutors to humanize the people that are that they're dealing with right so whether they're a victim of a crime or whether the person is the person who stands accused of that crime uh, we have to recognize that they're human right and we have to actually have curiosity to want to learn more about that individual so that we can better understand what the true needs are and how to address the, the situation or this incident that we're being asked to respond to. I think when you have that type of proximity, that's mm -hmm. really, really important. So like, for instance, when I when we send somebody to uh, Red Wing for the juvenile uh, correctional facility or we send them to prison, mm -hmm. I also want them to understand like what's going to happen there. And so we mandate that our prosecutors do tours of these facilities and actually meet the people that are there. Mm. Um, but I think that is so important. Now, the way that our system is set up is that typically prosecutors aren't supposed to have this type of connection, right? Mm. We are told that they're supposed to reach out to the victims and work with them. Oh, yeah. But we can't have much of a relationship because it's an adversarial process. And right. so what we're doing in our youth justice division is partnering with the defense attorney and to get that better understanding so we can have better resolutions for right. these particular cases. So that work um, uh, is uh, ongoing. It's really important. And uh, I really think that our version and quality of justice and also safety for everybody uh, over the long run is going to be better. So what I've been trying to do is create a new way of developing how we make decisions about what we do in the justice, in the youth justice system, especially like, you know, are we going to file a petition uh, or maybe we could refer this to somewhere else. Right. But we, instead of us making the decision all on our alone, we're, we're including other uh, voices to help advise us about what we should be doing with each individual case. And so that's our collaborative review team, and that's our effort to kind of reimagine a new paradigm or a new justice system for how we respond to youth who are um, uh, involved with the justice system. So we started that in the summer of 2021, and we're still at it, and we're going to have some research that we're going to um, release to the public but at the end of the day what i want is like this new reformed way of thinking about things mm -hmm. a reimagined justice system yes and then compare that to the old system right and we've got lots of data about the old system yeah. and what the old system does is that it produces massive racial disparity yes yeah. i don't think it actually makes us safer never and um what we also find in that in that uh old system is that a lot of times we're just processing people and it just gets them to get to a conviction and then we move on to the next case. Yes. If we could start with a different paradigm that sees everybody, the victim, the person that was harmed and the person who was accused of doing the harm as human beings, mm -hmm. right? And to somehow figure out a way to make right whatever happened so we have accountability, mm -hmm. that we have healing for the victim, we have healing for the person, maybe that young person, because again, it hurt people, it hurt, hurt people. people. Right. Yeah, definitely. And if we could get uh, that young person to stop the negative behavior, right, and do right by the victim, that's justice. Yeah, definitely. So, how do you feel about restorative justice? Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, that, that's what I'm. That's, that's what I'm, instead yeah. of an adversarial thing where I have to get a conviction on somebody, and we fight. I fight with the defense attorney to try to me getting a conviction. They say no, you can't get a conviction, and then someone makes a decision. Right. right? How is that like 
fair. I mean, healing. Yeah, How does that, that, they bring justice, right? Yeah, yeah that that has no. It, it doesn't like for if for what I also had Justin Justin Terrell on yeah. a while ago, and he spoke on how most people all they want is to make sure that that crime that happened to them not happen again. It's all he wants. Or to somebody else, right? Yeah, that's all. I hear all that he, from victims all the time. That's all he wants. Yeah. So it's not putting a person in prison. In fact, I just had a, yeah. a, a female from, a lady, a mother from Ramsey County who had her son uh, murdered in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And she says, I don't even want him to go to jail. I just want to talk to him. Yeah. Whoever. You know, so you have this compassionate, like the people don't, they just... They don't want these person to go to prison. They understand it doesn't work. They just yeah. don't want them to go out and do the same thing again. I think generally that's absolutely true. Now, I'll tell you, though, there are situations where maybe um, your loved one, your only son is murdered, right? Yeah. And oftentimes a victim will be pounding on the table and saying, I want, you know, punishment. I want retribution, right? Yes. And oftentimes what I find, and these are the hardest conversations for me, because this family has perceived that they have never had justice ever, right? Mm -hmm. And then their loved one is killed, right? Mm -hmm. And then the way oftentimes a victim will show up is that they're demanding some punitive response. Yes. And if I don't give that to them, again, it perpetuates that injustice, right? Yes. So those are just really hard conversations that we've got to also reckon with as well about how we have better con uh, conversations and think about like what is justice. But oftentimes when we, when we, isolate someone who's been harmed at the worst moment in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. um, it may not be how they feel maybe a year later down the road as well. So it's just, it's really complicated is what I'm trying to say. It, 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 def it definitely is. I mean, I think that it goes back to what you were saying when you're being fed this mythology yeah. that somehow, um, like you say, that it was, they were, they were tried by a jury or mm -hmm. um that um, that everything like I had one gentleman ask me when I was locked up. He sat down at the table. He had just his his first eighteen months, and he asked me a question because I was I was always in the law library, mm -hmm. um, just known for yeah. knowing the law and writing motions and petitions and stuff like that. He asked me, "What do they do to prove that you're innocent?" Because he was talking about his appeal. Because he figured yeah. through his appeal, that's what that was the process. I laughed at him. Yeah. I'm like that. That the system itself doesn't even, but we've been, we've been, um, myth, the mythology about it is forensics is working on for both parties mm -hmm. and, um, and somehow the, uh, to me, this is me speaking, in my opinion, that the trial was fair. I just feel like the defense is under budget, budgeted. They have a huge caseload and, um, and it becomes that bartering system where they're bartering, uh, it's a plea agreement, right. um, and not a trial. So, um, so that was that, that was that. So it's just, yeah. so it's just, I think the reason why most people who they fall into that retribution of punitive is that they've been programmed is that that's acceptable. Yeah, right. and, and if they truly knew what the outcome was, mm -hmm. they wouldn't want it. Right. You know, and it's, it goes back to like, 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 like we're, like we're talking to about just the prison system and their theory that taking a person out of the community somehow reduces, uh, the crime and it just it's a forms a void for someone else to right. fall back into it and for it to continue. Yeah. How did it work when you were um you you I, I know uh, I think it was last summer you had a lot of car burglaries going on mm -hmm. and you said you knew who was doing it and you wanted yeah. to work with the right. community. Right. How did that play itself out? Yeah. So you're thinking you're talking about the carjacking because yes. really freaked everybody out yeah. uh, because uh, this is something that we just hadn't experienced before, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but I want to tell you that because we've been working with community and we've got law enforcement who are paying more attention to this, right? We've actually reduced those carjackings by over 50%. With the community engagement? Yeah, the right. Okay, Absolutely. great. So they're not happening as they once were. Now, you know, still having like 50 some carjacking is still too many. Yes. Right? But I really feel like there's a, there's a lot of people that are working together. Instead of like blaming each other about why this is happening. I think people have come together in Ramsey County to kind of think about like how do we stop this from occurring and doing some interventions with families and supports uh, with parents. Oftentimes, I see that um, parents are just desperate for yeah. help. Well, so I think we should help them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know what? When you were talking, I was thinking about someone, something someone told me. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you're going to take this with you or, or or talk about it even further. But I had a, a gentleman in Cook County who did 27 years 
who's trying to get back out because he was locked up at 15 years old. Yeah. So he's he's been going through all the processes, yeah. showing a re reputation. Shout out to Derek Jordan. Um, can't wait to see the brother out on the other side. Uh, he but he worked the whole time. But um, but now what what they've done because he's going back to get retried or have re sentence reduced or whatever. He's in Cook County, the uh, county jail. And um, our conversation was right now when people come through county jails, mm -hmm. it's ground zero. The person's at the worst part and worst possible point in their lives. Why don't we then at that particular time find out what they need and correct it instead of sending them to prison? Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, they're. I've seen people find religion there yeah. in county jail, yeah. connect with family members because you're at that point where you're unfrozen and you're willing to accept anything, mm -hmm. um, you're, whether it be God to get you out of prison, whether it be whatever. So why don't we bring social services in at that time and heal that person mm -hmm. so they come out and become a better person? And um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I just feel like at that, whether they're, if they're, if they're stealing things, they're stealing because they don't have anything or they, or, or they think that it's right. I mean, why don't we bring them in at that particular time and, 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 and actually have a mentor or something mm -hmm. to, to get that individual out of that process. Right. And I think that, um, there are lots of, like, if you dig deeper, there are really lots of reasons for justice involvement. And oftentimes it's like drug uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. It could be mental health issues, especially with mental health issues. Yeah, definitely. And so, yeah, I think that we should be demanding as a part of any type of correctional system that we have, right, that those services are a big part of that. Right, definitely. And I, the, the quicker we end, like, like, so you want to give me all types of stuff through corrections, like if I'm in, mm -hmm. and if I'm in prison, you want to survive right. provide but then when i get out you want to disconnect all that when like i said all i need is those services whether it be employment housing um whether it might just be a mentor mm -hmm. uh somebody that could be i could be responsible right. to that would watch me and make sure that I'm, I'm 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 doing what i need to do um is there anything what's on we're, we're getting down to our last couple of minutes is there anything that's coming up that we you want us to know about yeah there's one thing. Uh, so uh, both uh, Mary Moriarty and myself and Keith Ellison, our attorney general, we're working on a bill uh, to have prosecutor initiated resentencing. True. Yeah. So that bill, I think, has a good chance to pass this year. Representative Kelly Moeller is carrying it in the House and Senator Ron Latz in the Senate. But we'd like to have that tool to have a very clear way that we could resentence people uh, for uh, when it's appropriate. Is, so, is that anything? Is it, a, is it an open deck? Like, no matter what it is, I can resentence them if I see it being an issue? Yeah, like if somebody is rehabilitated, maybe we realize now in hindsight that that sentence term was too long or that there's an issue related to maybe the person was convicted at the age of you know, 14, tried it as an adult. Uh, it gives prosecutors the benefit of utilizing hindsight as a justice tool mm -hmm. and to go backwards in time and uh, exhibit some aspect of uh, mercy and forgiveness and uh, really uh, explore whether or not true rehabilitation has occurred. We're, right? we're, we're in a system that should I, should, can they do it? Can I do it while I'm serving my 30 year? I'm, I'm 15 years into my 30, write you a petition and request uh, that 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 my sentence get relooked at, yeah, or do I have right. to be out? No, you could be you could be in prison. Absolutely. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah. What would that look? What type of vehicle would that take on? Would that take on a petition through the lower courts to so you? So it would be a prosecutor initiated resentence. Okay. So the prosecutor would have to initiate it. Right? Okay. And so for jurisdictions that truly want to do this, what they'll do is they'll set up programs like they have in Chicago and Cook County, or like in California and Seattle and Oregon. There's a number of states that have passed this, and what happens there is that um, the prosecutors who are serious about it will actually look in to see who they have sent to prison in the past, who's still there, and looking to see whether or not it would be appropriate to revisit uh, their past sentence. That would that set up a whole other team of uh, junior DAs that would look into that Absolutely. and then bring it to your attention? Yeah, right. Now, are you, are you, you, you don't try cases, right? You, you're, you're, yeah, I've been in the courtroom in a long time. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you're just making recommendations yeah. and, um, and doing, and, and doing things. I, what, the one thing I was watching, t t uh, Larry Krasner last night a little bit and, uh, was, and I went on to mm -hmm. John 
And I think that I think that the main thing about it, this is the final thing I wanted to say. It's just almost uh and I wanted you to think, I don't know if you thought about it. Mm-hmm. As the as the metros metro DAs become more progressive, yeah, what we're seeing is a lot of these rural DAs keeping that same behavior going because they really don't have to change. Right. So the pushback again, like you were saying about when you decided to reduce the minor infraction yeah. when it comes to vehicles, they were, you know, some, some people went on with it and other people right. didn't. Um, but you see that pushback. And um, I just feel like as though, as, as you guys make the progressive movement, um, the backlash is going to be these rural DAs who are going to side with the um, 1994 lock them up predatory juvenile offenders and let's keep that moving. Well, I think, you know, we've got to recognize too that in this country, we're unique. We're the only people on this planet that actually elects our prosecutors. Yeah. I, yeah. I, so I, I do think that prosecutors will generally do what their community wants them to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And so here in the metropolitan area, you know, in my jurisdiction here in Ramsey County, I have lots of people who are very open to this type of change and reform and the work that we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. I know that it's supported by at least the majority of the people, mm-hmm. right? There are certain people that probably are very uncomfortable by it. Yeah. But it allows me to do that. Now, in other communities, maybe outside of the metro, their communities might not allow for this conversation because they haven't evolved in a place where they're thinking about it, these issues in the way that we are. And the reason why we are is because there are people like you and others who are bringing forward a new perspectives around what justice should be in our community. And any good elected prosecutor is going to be listening to that, right. be reflecting on it, right? And also evolving with that conversation. So I'm hopeful that, you know, like in our future, right, we are going to have um, a more robust uh, conversation around criminal justice and not just fall back to the, the the way that we used to think about things, right? We can't go back to uh, mass incarceration and say that our solutions are found by locking everything up that moves, mm-hmm. right? And oftentimes it's black and brown people. Right. right. We can't, we can't, we got to come up with these strategies, right? We have carjackings and shootings that are happening, right? We've got to think about better ways that we actually utilize the police, right? We should have them focus on some of the violent crime, but we should be developing alternative responder models. We should be developing strategies for policing that don't harm communities, but actually work with communities to solve crime. You know, one of the biggest issues that we have right now in our public safety systems is that the police don't solve crimes. <laughs> right. And the reason why is because communities don't feel safe cooperating with the police. Um, so we need to change that. Yeah, and that, that's a that's a whole whole other conversation. I've always been on a position where I've been anti police just because I believe that the community itself can they there's no need to call the police when the community itself knows who's committing the crimes. They have family members that they have to go back to. And they should be accountable to someone. We should be the ones for releasing our communities. Um, and it should be no, there should be no, there should be no reason why you can't, you can walk, I can go into, I can go up to Noka County uh, or go into Coon Rapids and walk down my street and feel comfortable. Then I go over north and I don't feel comfortable. It should not even be like that because they're both communities. Mm-hmm. I just think what's been, well, a lot of things have been going on is the, the removal of the word community and hood and yeah. things like that's been utilized and that diminishes the community right. aspect of it. But they're both communities. And there's no reason why you should feel different and or policing should be different in any of those communities. Um, we're at the, the, the hour point. Well, I'm hoping that we can um, get John back. And we can talk. Um, a little bit more about different uh, different things. Maybe get um, uh, Mary Moriarty and you, mm-hmm. or just you know just a, a more rich, developed conversation yeah. on criminal justice and what we see the future being. Um, because as much as it affects you, because it's your job, it affects me. Because I have children in the community, I have friends in the community, um, I'm part of the community, um, and I believe that um, we need to open up this dialogue and talk more about right. it and be open. No open toward it. Yeah, absolutely. Appear to be part of the conversation. We can have a better uh, a, a system that's worthy of its name.
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 What do you got to say about uh, SAF Mo saying white MFers? I don't give a fuck what anybody says because it's America and you should be able to do and say what the fuck you want. God bless America. Uh.